Thank you for joining us on our YouTube channel as we strive to get a more progressive voice of faith out to a larger audience. Our videos are mostly from the pastor at Community Christian Church in Springfield, Missouri, Dr. Roger Ray. We are always pleased to have feedback from our viewers. You can visit our website at spfccc.org or write to us at Reverend Dr. Ray at AOL.com. The story of Jonah uh, in the Old Testament is a parable, and, and in my opinion, it is one of the most wonderful and yet one of the most misunderstood books in all of the Bible. It was never intended to describe a historical event. This short work doesn't tell us about a real person, or for that matter, it doesn't tell us about a real city. Um, certainly, uh, the city under question didn't take three days to walk across. And much to many folks' uh, disappointment, it's not even about a real whale. It struggles to tell us something about God and our anger. And like any well-crafted parable, it's full of irony and humor and dramatic action. The story is set up this way. A Jewish man is called by God to go and preach to the capital city of Assyria. It is set in a time when Assyria has destroyed Israel, pretty well messed up Judah and most of their neighbors. Assyria was practicing that uh, much coveted ancient form of warfare in which their nation built up their wealth by raiding their neighbors and taking all of their stuff. Assyria had never done anything good for a Jew. They had done some very outlandish, criminal, and reprehensibly violent things, uh, and they had pretty well destroyed most of the tribes of Jewish people. So this is a very tense setup that God is telling Jonah to go and preach to the people that he would have naturally hated the most. Now, biblical scholars agree that this story is not actually nearly old enough to have been written during the time of the Assyrian rule. It was written much later, two or three hundred years later. And if you're going to write uh, something that is going to challenge the values of all your neighbors and friends, one really convenient way to do it is to do it anonymously and to write it as if it had been written a couple hundred years ago so that none of your neighbors will look in and say, did you write this? So, so the writer of, of this parable sets it in an ancient conflict to deal with what for him was a current conflict. It was written in a time when the tiny little remnant of Jews was trying to rebuild a scrap of a nation on the ruins left behind from nearly a century of slavery in Babylon. And in those days of reconstruction, there was just an awful lot of anger. They'd been bullied, they'd been robbed, they'd been burned out, their olive trees had been cut down, salt had been thrown on their farmland, they had been sold into slavery. Then they were finally just almost uh, dumped, totally vulnerable in a nearly barren land in a city with no walls and very little to eat and, and sort of a pat on the back and say, well, best of luck to you. So the person who sat down to write Jonah lived among a ragtag bunch of survivors who kept themselves alive in large part by feeding themselves on how much they hated Babylonians and Egyptians and Syrians and just about anyone that didn't look and sound Jewish. And when people are so certain that their hatred is justified, when they know for a fact that their bloodthirsty prayers are heard by God, then it's very, very awkward to offer an alternative opinion. Sometimes when people are that mad, the best way to approach it is with a little bit of slapstick humor. It kind of breaks the ice. So the story starts with Jonah going in the opposite direction from where God told him to go. And God causes a great storm to strike the ship at sea. And then even pagan Gentiles are getting religion and they are begging God to help them. And finally, they do what Jonah says has to be done. They throw him overboard into a raging sea, and immediately the sea calms down. So uh, the preacher is not being obedient to God, but the sea's being obedient to God, and pagan sailors, I don't know if you've ever personally known any pagan sailors, but they're pretty pagan. Uh, they're, they're being obedient to God. And then a giant fish swallows Jonah. Even the fish is working for God. And the fish swims for three days to spit him out onto the shores of Nineveh. 
this is not a, a travel plan that you can book with Expedia.com. <laughs> This is a parable, and you need to understand it as a parable. If you try to get real fact literal about this, your head will explode. But everyone in the story is being obedient to God. The weather, the fish, the, the sea, pagan sailors. The one defiant person is Jonah, the preacher. No, don't go too far with that. <laughs> because, you see, Jonah's got a serious mad on. I've had that. You've had that. It's not just that he thought Judaism was that much better than the religion of Assyria or that Judah was all that much better a nation. It was that he had seen the wreckage. He had seen the slaughter. He knew people who had been killed, enslaved, raped, robbed. His anger was a righteous anger that doesn't really believe that anyone who disagrees with him can be anything but stupid or evil or probably some of both. You've, you've heard this in recent political dialogue, that if you disagree, then you're, you're not just wrong, you're evil. And, and that's sort of the intonation that's being written here. Jonah walks into the middle of this huge, monstrous city and delivers a very short and pretty sad attempt at a sermon. He preached a sermon in which he said, y'all going to die, and it's going to happen pretty soon. <laughs> um, and against all credible odds, they actually believed him. I've never tried preaching that sermon, but I don't think it would go very well. But, but this is a parable. You know, this is not a description of history. So he walks into the middle of the city, says, God really hates you a lot, and you are going to die a bloody, horrible death. And then the entire city repents. And the storyteller tells us that not only did the people repent and the king repented, but for goodness sakes, the cattle repented. The cattle are wearing sackcloth and ashes. This is the best preacher in the history of the world. <laughs> but of course, that's part of the irony because Jonah didn't really want to be a good preacher. He didn't want them to repent. He just wanted to vent his spleen. He just wanted to be able to tell them, uh, you all have messed up one too many times and you're about to get it in the neck. Because Jonah wants them to be destroyed. Jonah wants God to get in to the destroying evil business. Because if God won't do that, then what's God good for in the first place? If God won't act against injustice, then God's just not getting involved. Doesn't God become outraged by mass destruction? Doesn't God want us to help God wipe out Nineveh and every city that's like it? So Jonah goes up on the ridge overlooking the city to wait and see because he's confident that they're such horrible people that, that their repentance will be short-lived. They will turn back to their evil ways and then God will kill them. You know, it gets hot. It gets real hot when you don't have anything but your anger to keep you company. If you're just left alone with your anger. And Jonah's just sitting up there boiling. In Alcoholics Anonymous, they say that anger is a dubious luxury. It's a luxury because it's an emotion that some people can revel in, but recovering alcoholics know that it's a luxury they can't afford. If they get angry, it won't be very long before they get drunk. It's a dubious luxury, even for people who aren't alcoholics, because you're not going to get much good out of it. Anger doesn't seem to make people very smart, does it? Anger doesn't seem to make people very spiritual. It doesn't make them compassionate or loving. And a whole lot of the time, it makes them do something uh, excessively destructive oftentimes self-destructive. The Buddha says that the fire that you kindle against your enemy burns you. Uh, some of the desert fathers were known to say that the, the smoke of the fire you set against your enemy fills your own eyes and nostrils. It's very difficult to act in anger and not end up punishing yourself. The wisdom of AA is that when I'm angry, it usually means that there's something rather wrong with me. The big book of AA calls anger a poison, and I think it may well be just that. But let me return to my biblical story. Jonah is sitting on a ridge watching the city, and a vine grows up over the little shack where he's sitting, and the vine is the only decent thing that's happened to Jonah since that fish swallowed him. At least the vine offers him some shade. However, 
Just as the weather, the sea, the fish, and the pagans are obedient to God, God now sends a worm, a worm of all things, to do God's will, and the worm eats through the vine, and the vine dies. And for that, Jonah's just, it's just the last straw. So Jonah turns his anger on God. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. Ever been there? So mad. I just wish I could die. I just wish I didn't have to tolerate this for another moment. And God says to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about a bush? You want to die because the vine is gone? And Jonah, you know how logical anger can be. Jonah says, yes, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, now you're concerned about that vine, which you didn't plant, you didn't till it, you didn't labor for it, you didn't make it grow. It came into being in a night and it perished in a night. But you think I should not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their left from their right. See, this is... This is the attempt that the writer of this parable is making to say, can you look at the people that you're wanting to kill? Can you think about them as people first? When, Jonah, when God asks Jonah, do you do well to be angry? Jonah doesn't even understand the question because anger is its own logic. Why wouldn't he be angry? Because the Assyrians were guilty. I mean, you know, there's, there's no disputing that if you take this context in which he's writing, the Assyrians had done horrible things. So angry at God for not destroying them? I can, I can understand that. I can sympathize with that. Angry at the vine for dying and making him so uncomfortable? I even get that. I get it. I get it. You know, that it seems that life owes us some little bit of comfort, doesn't it? You know the routine. You can get angry at illegal immigrants so that when you see signs in Spanish at the hardware store, you're afraid that you're losing your country. You can get angry at Muslims for raising terrorists who have no remorse for their heinous deeds. You get angry at auto workers for demanding salaries that bankrupt American businesses. Angry at bankers who help to wreck the economy. Angry at gay people for expecting the same rights as straight people. But it's not that Jonah and his people did not have reason to be angry, it was that he also had a lot of reason to get over it. The message of Jonah to the people who first read it was that their captivity in Babylon was over and it was time for them to stop hating, to accept the interracial marriages among them, to accept the mixed blood Jews, the Jews who spoke other languages or who had family members who were even of another religion. But men and women, the stakes are much higher for us today than they were for the first people who read Jonah. War in the 21st century is a lot more serious than it was 2,500 years ago. Our nation has been at war for the past decade, and now we appear to be teetering towards starting a new and probably much more bloody conflict than the last two wars we've been in. I want to ask you to take just a moment to look at a couple of maps. Uh, this is a map of Iran. The 10 American flags around Iran show where we have American military installations. And I've taken a look at this map, and I don't think that it's complete. I think there's probably 13 or 14 uh, military installations uh, that we have around Iran. Some of you know a lot more about it than I do. But that's Iran's view of their own country. Now, the second map is a map of the United States, which shows all of the Iranian military installations surrounding us. Uh, I take it that you may have noticed that there aren't any. So let's look at it again. Here's uh, the American military installations around Iran, and here are the Iranian military installations around the United States. Now, one of these nations is accusing the other nation of having aggressive military objectives <laughs> and is seriously talking about a preemptive invasion to stop them from their insane rogue military goals. Now, I'm no expert on these things. Some of you are. I'm no expert. 
But if you look at this map from an Iranian's perspective, would you feel like you might have reason to beef up your arsenal? I mean, if you're looking for inspiration to kind of stand down, would you get it from, from being aware of what's going on all around the perimeter of your country? We are being asked at this time to be very frightened by the prospect of Iran developing a nuclear weapon because they might use it against Israel. And again, I'm no expert, but Israel has an estimated 100 nuclear weapons. And I suspect that what would keep Iran from bombing Israel is the same thing that kept us from bombing Russia and Russia from bombing us all during the Cold War, mutually assured destruction. Now, I don't like it. I wish the world could be ridded entirely of all nuclear weapons. But what makes, what makes Iran crazy under these circumstances for thinking that they should have a nuclear weapon, if that makes them crazy and international terrorists, what does it say about us if we have 6,000 nuclear weapons? I mean, logically, you have to be willing to look at yourself as well as looking at them. And so God asks Jonah, do you do well to be angry? And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city where there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their left from their right? God asks Jonah to look at the inhabitants of the city that he wants to have destroyed. And I just think that's a capital idea. And I would like for us to take a couple of minutes to just look at some of the people in Iran. I've been happy lately Thinking about the good things to come And I believe it could be Something good has begun Yes, I've been smiling lately Dreaming about the world as one And I believe it could be Someday it's going to come Cause out on the edge of darkness There rides a peace train Oh, peace train, take this country Come take me home again Yes, I've been smiling lately Thinking about the good things to come And I believe it could be Something good has begun Oh, peace train, sounding louder Light on peace train Your bags together Go bring your good friends too Cause it's getting nearer Soon we'll be with you Just come and join the living It's not so far from you And it's getting nearer Soon it will all be true Oh, peace train sounding louder Glide on the peace train Beach Boy song, Bomberan. <laughs> bom, bom, bom. In years past, we've invaded Mexico, we've invaded Canada, we've gone to war with England, France, Germany, and Japan, all of which are now close allies and trading partners. Well, maybe with the exception of France. I still like the wine and cheese. It is possible for old enemies to become allies. It is possible to find a way around the anger and to move towards something that is much more healthy. Not out of fear, but out of courage. Because men and women, the root of anger is almost always fear. You don't have to move towards peace because you are ignorant and naive, but because you have a powerful faith. The question the Bible poses to us is to wonder if we do well to be angry. 
Jonah asks us to remember how compassionate that God is and asks us to see how silly we look when we cannot see that our bloodlust is not echoed by God. If I could wish one thing for my nation today, it is just this. I wish that my people would stop being afraid. You've been watching a progressive Christian video from the Community Christian Church of Springfield, Missouri. We encourage our viewers to donate to our efforts in feeding the homeless and hungry of our community. Write to us at Reverend Dr. Ray at AOL.com for more information.